it's a radio thing wouldn't understand. This month's first stone is Alexander. This month's flower is rose. This month we are we are voting for our ranking and queen. Don't forget to vote. This month we are also celebrating Father's Day on June 16th. This month will this month will be uh, celebrating our prom on June 18th at Boulevard Heights Community Center. Please take home your prom paper and all and RSVP for prom. We would also be celebrating our third annual family reunion. This month is also hurricane season. The season officially begins on June 1st and and, and on November 30th. Please be per, please be prepared. Restock on food, medication, flashlights, batteries, cash, and first aid kits, supplies. Um, plan how to communicate with family members if you lose power. Keep in keep car in good working condition and keep the gas tank full and cover all your home windows. Storm shutters offer the best protection for the windows. Now stand to the budget. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight. All the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming, and the rockets rang the light of the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag was. Still there, oh say does that star spangle band there yet for the land of the free and the Please pray along with me as we go to the Lord in prayer, going to Psalms 100. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye land. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pastures. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endure to all generations. Amen.
I move on. It's been so good. Is that anybody else's testimony about beside myself? Tell them you've been so I see you, Betty Jackson. Been so good. Good to see you, girl. You've been so good. You've been so been so good. We are still learning our Bill of Rights. I have the right to vote. I have the right to see a doctor. I have the right to go to church. I have the right to remain disciplined. I have the right to community outings. I have the right to talk. I have the right to education. I have the right to receive treatment. I have the right to drive and spend dignity. I have the right to make money. I have the right to exercise. I have the right to see my records. I have right to own possessions. I have right to see services. I have right to no discrimination. I have right to no physical harm. When the next general election rolls around, who will be eligible to show up at the polls and vote for the President of the United States? It's really pretty simple. If you are at least 18 years old, a citizen of the U.S., and a resident of a state, you can vote. Assuming, that is, you're not a felon. Seems about right. After all, the United States prides itself on being a democracy, or a government in which the ultimate authority lies with the citizens of the nation. But it was not always this way. In 1789, George Washington won the Electoral College with 100% of the vote. But whose vote was it? Probably not yours. Only 6% of the entire United States population was allowed to vote at all. Voting was a right that only white male property owners were allowed to exercise. By the 1820s and 1830s, the American population was booming from the East Coast into the Western frontier. Frontier farmers were resilient, self-reliant, and mostly ineligible to vote because they did not own land. As these new areas of the nation became states, they typically left out the property requirement for voting. Leaders such as Andrew Jackson, the United States' first common man president, promoted what he called universal suffrage. Of course, by universal suffrage, Jackson really meant universal white male suffrage. All he emphasized was getting rid of the property requirement for voting, not expanding the vote beyond white men. By the 1850s, about 55% of the adult population was eligible to vote in the U.S., much better than 6%, but far from everybody. Then, in 1861, the American Civil War began largely over the issue of slavery and states' rights in the United States. When it was all over, the U.S. ratified the 15th Amendment, which promised that a person's right to vote could not be denied based on race, color, or previous condition as a slave. This meant that black men, newly affirmed as citizens of the U.S., would now be allowed to vote. Of course, laws are far from reality. Despite the promise of the 15th Amendment, intimidation kept African Americans from exercising their voting rights. States passed laws that limited the rights of African Americans to vote, including things like literacy tests, which were rigged so that not even literate African Americans were allowed to pass, and poll taxes. So despite the 15th Amendment, by 1892, only about 6% of black men in Mississippi were registered to vote. By 1960, it was only 1%. And of course, women were still totally out of the national voting picture. It wasn't until 1920 that the women's suffrage movement won their 30-year battle and the 19th Amendment finally gave women the vote. Well, white women. The restrictions on African Americans, including African American women, remained. 
After World War II, many Americans began to question the state of U.S. democracy. How could a nation that fought for freedom and human rights abroad come home and deny suffrage based on race? The modern civil rights movement began in the 1940s with those questions in mind. After years of sacrifice, bloodshed, and pain, the United States passed the Voting Rights Act of 1965, finally eliminating restrictions such as literacy tests and protecting the voting rights promised under the 15th Amendment to the Constitution. Now, any citizen over the age of 21 could vote. All seemed well, until the United States went to war. When the Vietnam War called up all men aged 18 and over for the draft, many wondered whether it was fair to send men who couldn't vote to war. In 1971, the 26th Amendment to the Constitution made all citizens 18 and older eligible to vote, the last major expansion of voting rights in the United States. Today, the pool of eligible voters in the U.S. is far broader and more inclusive than ever before in U.S. history, but of course it's not perfect. There are still active efforts to suppress some groups from voting, and only about 60% of those who can vote do. Now that you know all the hard work that went into securing the right to vote, what do you think? Do enough citizens have the right to vote now? And among those who can vote, why don't more of them do it? Hello. I'm John Kelly, Secretary of the United States Department of Homeland Security. As we enter hurricane season, we at the Department of Homeland Security and FEMA are working closely with our state, local, and federal partners to increase preparedness and coordinate response and recovery capabilities. We're also empowering individuals to take an active role in preparing themselves and their families and their communities. It only takes one hurricane to change your life and your community. Hurricanes are one of nature's most powerful and destructive events. They've caused eight of the 10 costliest disasters in U.S. history. Now is the time to prepare, especially if you or a family member live in an area prone to hurricanes or inland flooding. Here are three things you can do. First, know your risk. Find out today what types of impacts could happen where you live. Hurricanes are not just a coastal problem. High winds, heavy rainfall, tornadoes, and flooding can be felt hundreds of miles inland. They can potentially cause loss of life and catastrophic damage to property. Two, prepare, take action now. When a storm is approaching, it's too late. Make sure you have family evacuation and communications plans. Update your emergency supply kit and evaluate your flood insurance well before a storm is on its way. Three, stay informed. Know where to go for trusted sources of information during a hurricane event. To search for information about risks in your area, visit www.ready gov and search for your state. To find hurricane forecasts, watches, and warnings, check with NOAA's National Hurricane Center, the Central Pacific Hurricane Center, and www.weather.gov. You can also download the FEMA app. The app includes disaster resources, weather alerts, safety tips, and push notifications to users' devices. It is designed to help families better prepare for disasters. I encourage you to visit each of these sites as soon as possible to make sure you know what to do to protect your family and property during hurricane season. Thank you.